So yeah, yeah. Thank you so and much. Um, as we continue our series, we're going to close today. Uh, let, let us review really quick the six principles. We're going to close with principle seven and principle eight of our series, Relationship, Loving Like Jesus. And uh, you're going to have it on screens, but principle one, we, we uh, mentioned that we must place the highest value on relationship, literally just following Jesus' footsteps, because he gave high value uh, to, to relationships and uh, he led us into understanding that um, we got to be excellent at relating. And if we follow him, we will have the right path to do so. Uh, principle number two, act like your feelings are important, not just actions. Feelings are also very important. Number three, love one another as I have loved you. So um, he elevated that principle, that commandment of love one another as you love yourself. He said, love one another as I have loved them, which requires a higher standard. Uh, but he has given us the example for us to follow. It is possible to love like Jesus. Yes, it is. Number four, communicate from the heart. Um, and number five, think of others as more important than yourselves. We spoke about that last week. And number six, in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. So let's get right into it. We find principle 7 of loving like Jesus in Mark chapter 10 verse 42 45 I'm going to read from the living um, Bible translation it says so Jesus called them to him and said as you know as like you've heard this before the kings and great men of earth lord lord it over the people but among you is different say with me different whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, principle seven. And whoever wants to be greatest of all must be slave of all. For even I, the Messiah, Jesus, I'm not here to be served, but to help others and to give my life as a ransom for many. Principle seven in our relationship series, Loving Like Jesus, is whoever wants to be great among us, it must be a servant. It must be a servant. And I think we have to understand that all of us here have been called to serve. By this I, I say, all of us here have been called to be the greatest. Yes, God called you and me to be the greatest, to live lives that are the greatest possible lives that we can live the problem sometimes is the perspective and the understanding that we have of what it is to be the greatest person in the room. What Jesus is saying that the greatest person in the room is the servant. That he himself as the Messiah, the son of God, the king of kings, the Alpha and the Omega, the, the, Alpha and the, Omega, the beginning and the end, he did not come to be served, but rather he was here to serve others. And uh, I think today is going to be amazing because we're going to see a story in the Bible. These verses will serve as the foundation of our conversation today. And there's some characters here um, in the Bible that we're going to learn from them. They're called uh, teachers of religious law and Pharisees. Now, here's the thing with this group of people. This group of people were called to be servants. They had a position and they had power within the people to serve the people. Just like nowadays, pastors and leaders and, and, and people in government, they have positions of power to serve the people. Because that's the purpose, right? To be the greatest as God has called us. Yes, we need to serve. So we're going to learn from them. And we're going to learn the reality that these teachers of the law and these Pharisees, these religious leaders that were supposed to serve the people, weren't really doing it. They were not really serving the people. They were actually serving themselves. So go with me. We're going to read Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 through 12. I'm going to read it all. And then we're going to take some of these verses into, and uh, put them in some of our points today so we can learn from them. And let's see what they did. 
Verse 1 says, says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. They're here to serve you. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. Wait, what? For they don't practice what they teach. Number four says they crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Verse five says everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra long tassels. Verse six, and they love to sit at the head of the table at the banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. Verse seven, they love to receive respectful greeting, greetings as they walk in the marketplaces, and they love to be called rabbi. Verse eight says, don't don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher, and one and all of you are equals as brothers and sisters. Verse 9. And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your father. He's talking within this context. Verse 10 says, And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you have only one teacher, the Messiah. Here's the key, verse 11. The greatest among you must be a servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves, sorry, will be exalted. We find in these passages of scripture three things that these so-called servants of the people were doing that servants of the people are not supposed to do. So if we're going to speak on how to be servants, this group of leaders will teach us what not to do so that we can learn what to do. Are you with us? Over there at home, online, you're with us? Let's get right into it. The first thing we can see and note here, we find them in verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4 say, So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease their burden. The first thing they did to the people was that they placed the burden of unrealistic expectations. Jesus is saying, hey, listen. What they're telling you is good, but what they're doing is not. So follow what they say. Their teaching is good, but don't follow their example because they don't practice what they do. Talking about Jesus with no filters. In this moment, Jesus is not using no parables. Do you see the sky? <laughs> do you see the fig tree? Do you see the birds? No, no, no. He's saying there is people among you that are supposed to be serving you. They're not serving you. There are people being fake right now. They're supposed to be teaching the law. They're supposed to teach you my ways. They're supposed to be my representatives, and yet they're just representing themselves. It's crazy because on top, if we understand this, on top of the law being enough, heavy enough if I may, actually if you think about the law and you read the law of Moses, it's pretty unbearable. <laughs> There's so much in it that we cannot practice to the T. And they knew that. These people knew that. And on top of that, they will come and put extra rules. As in like, if you want to get closer to God, you got to do more. If you want to get closer to God, you got to be extra. It's never enough. Never enough. Never, never, you know that one? Never enough. Don't, yeah, yeah, I got in trouble. She's going like, hey, please stop. Let's go. This is serious. Sorry. Sorry. Placing unrealistic expectations on other people is easy. Even to ourselves. But Jesus has called us to love and lead like he did. The second thing they did 
You find it in verse 5. It says, everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with long tassels. I read this, and now I, it's, it's inevitable. Is Jesus into fashion now? Because he is literally talking clothing Or you here. ask yourself, who will do that like, to themselves? What? Who will put boxes with prayers and walk around like that? So, uh, no, I don't think Jesus was into fashion. I don't think so. Um, but I think these people were into fashion. I actually think these leaders, and, and uh, on the other hand, these leaders, they, they, they definitely look into, into fashion. They were going the extra mile, this mentality of go big or go home. And I want to show you something. This is a picture uh, of kind of like how they looked, if someone can help us there. Okay. If, if, the, if the camera can put, point it so that our people online can, can see it. This is not the religious leader, it's the, the, that one over there. <laughs> That's kind of like the outfit, right? And you see that, you go to Deuteronomy, you, you'll find that this is kind of like how it worked for them. This was their, pretty, pretty nice, right? Can you imagine me showing up to church like this on Sunday? It's like, let me read you a verse. <laughs> you know, the scriptures. <laughs> and then, no, but it, I got two verses for you because it's like, mm, I got my extra bucks right here. This is kind of like how they looked. They were, they were extra. They loved to showcase, you know. It's funny because the verse says it was extra large box. <laughs> so it's not a little box. It was like extra large box. But Jesus said it was a show. Yeah. They were just doing it for the gram, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's just for the gram. Oh, I'm here on t- Sunday. I'm going to preach the word of God today. Look at my beard. Well, I trimmed it, but whatever. You know, I'm wearing, mm, look at this. It's looking good. It's looking good. But it was a show. The problem was never and is never the clothes or the post or the extra size boxes where they put where they put it. The problem really was not even that they were making themselves look good. The real problem was that they were making themselves look like something they were not that they were not. The problem was they were focusing on appearance instead of substance. And if you and I know Jesus, you know that Jesus does not look at appearances. He looks at substance. He looks at the heart. Jesus is not in the business of looking good. Jesus is in the business of transforming hearts. So not only these people are putting heavy burdens, and on top of that, they're not even willing to do it themselves. Aside from that, they just want to look. They just want to look good. They just want to look good, but that is not the problem. They're trying to show something that they were not. And the worst thing is, it was in the name of God. And the third thing that we we see here is verses six and seven. Verse six and seven says. And they loved to sit at the head table, at banquets, and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They loved to receive respectful greetings as as they walk into the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. So Jesus is not, he keeps going, he ain't stopping. So you don't leave what you preach and you push people to, to do things you can't even do. You're putting up a show, you're shallow. Empty, an empty performance that praises your ego and does not praise God. And on top of that, you're looking at status instead of serving. You're looking at status instead of doing what I've called you to do, which is to be the greatest. He tells them that they love to be recognized and praised. That intentionally they look to these spaces and they have invested the time that they were meant and called to be serving, they have invested the time in making themselves look good. They have shifted their priority. And they have said, I am the priority, not God. If we actually read the rest of the chapter, which we don't have time to do so, we don't. But 
you will see that Jesus keeps, oof, you got to read it at home, okay? Take my word for it. He goes hard on them. And you can summarize everything that he's telling them to describe them in one word. We spoke about this word last week briefly, but that word is hypocrisy. In a fewer words, these leaders that were meant to be the greatest, that were meant to serve the people, that were meant to lead the people into the God's way, Jesus is confronting them and telling them, you're hypocrites. And the reality is that love and hypocrisy cannot coexist in the same room. And God has called us to lead with love. So maybe right now you're saying, this is horrible people. Or, or we can be already thinking on people like, hmm, that right, person, like, that leader, that oh, um, horrendous people. politician, you know, like so already putting names. So to, fake, to right? Like, I, oh, like those Pharisees. Huh, imagine the pastors and the leaders nowadays at church. <laughs> well, I'm it's hard to teach this being one of them. And yeah, the pressure is there for sure. Yes, we've been called to lead people God's ways. But let's come on. Let's be honest here for just one second, please. I beg you that maybe we can all identify being a Pharisee in our, in our hearts, in ourselves. Now, let me help you do that for just a second, asking you three really quick questions. Really quick questions. Have you ever placed high expectations on somebody else? Have you ever placed unrealistic expectations on somebody else in any relationship? Yeah. Might be your parents or people from work. Have you ever done that? Yeah. Have you ever focused more on how you looked and not how you are? Have you ever paid attention more on how people look in the outside rather than how they are inside? And the third question is, have you ever choose status over service, which was the third point. These leaders were choosing status over service. Have you ever been there? I think, including ourselves here today, we can all answer yes to that question. Yeah. And if not, you might be in denial, and that's okay. I'm glad you're here today. <laughs> I'm glad you're here today. I hope and I pray that as we go with the rest of our conversation, you can find yourself with the understanding in your heart that we, are, we all have some Pharisee inside of us. Yeah. And that although this was strictly for them as a message, this is a message for us to be applied today. So Steph, how do, how do we untangle crazy. these things? <laughs> Jesus. You know, I hope that we all leave today saying, today is for me. Because it's so easy for us just to pinpoint. But I, but I see it in relationships. I see it, I, I'm a people watcher, <laughs> not in a creepy way. But I love to go to the mall. I love Disney World and just sit down while I wait for everybody going to the crazy roller coasters and just sit down and kind of watch people. And it's so crazy how you see how we interact as a society. There is a um, um, TV show that my, my kids watch, our kids watch, and it's called Brainchild. And it, it's a whole bunch of like crazy explanations, but they put it in a kid version that kids can truly understand it. And one of the um, interactions that they had, or the explanations, was through interactions with social media. And they, one of the examples, I mean, I try to get it, but it was just impossible to be able to cut it for me. I'm sure not for the people over there. But for me, it was impossible to be able to cut it just in that piece because they showed a picture of a cat and they showed a picture of a, um, um, oh my gosh, a donkey. And the picture of the cat was horrible, was horrendous. I mean, you guys, if you like cats, I mean, it's beautiful. But, you know, some, some pictures don't look as nice. So the picture with the cat was low resolution. The cat was not cute. You know, he wasn't posing or anything. It was just like a random picture of a cat. But the, and, the, and then there was um, a donkey picture that it was high resolution, like a well National Geographic picture of a donkey. You could see like the eyelashes and you know, all these beautiful things. But the picture of the donkey had like 10 likes. And the picture of the of the ugly cat had thousands of likes. So the social experiment is that they were going to people at the mall and asking them, which is your favorite picture? Showing, uh, like it was a picture on Instagram where you can see all the, the, the likes and everybody 
95% of the people, in kids and adults, they were all um, choosing the cat one because of the likes. And even though the other one, the donkey one, was prettier, it, it had quality, oh, everybody was going over the one that had more likes because that's how society works. We just work and go after the titles. We go after the top ladder. So when they tell you, when you go and meet someone and, and they tell you, hi, my, um, I'm Dr. something, you're like, oh, oh, um, hi, nice to meet you. But if that same doctor comes in Cumbers with jeans and a white t-shirt and they just tell you, hey, my name is Sam. Oh, hey, Sam, what's up? It's so crazy how we treat people based on their likes. It's so funny. I've had people come to me and say, oh, um, hi, how are you? Do you have social media? I'm like, am I going to be judged by my social media <laughs> status or something? Because that's nowadays the conversations. If someone comes and depending on the car they drive, that's how they treat you. I've seen it. We have left our car in, you know, when you pay so that they can park it for you in the, um, oh, yeah, the valet, valet parking. Park for sure. Oh Paying my gosh, same. I've seen it. I went to a restaurant once last year for our anniversary, and our car, I mean, obviously, it's a pulling cute car. A, pulling in a RAV4. But you guys, like, I'm not into cars, box. so I don't care where I'm driving as long as it's taking me, and it has air because I live in Florida. But let me tell you that I saw the interaction with the people after me and behind me. So the people behind me had a really nice car, those that are really uncomfortable to get out of. It was a Maserati, guys, if you're okay. asking. And I'm telling you, the guy was like, welcome. I mean, I'm sure if he had flowers, he would have thrown the flowers. You know, and then we just got out. You guys, from, from leaving my kids from school, so you can already imagine the mess in the back. And, and the guy's like, hi, welcome. Hi, welcome. Why? Because they we see the tip you're going to give them. That's that, 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 but ah, we spoke about it and we said no, we're going to leave them we did. a lesson. We're going to give them a good tip. Because it's not about the car you drive, it's who you are as a person. But it's so crazy how we relate that way. We look first at the appearance, we look first at the titles, we, we treat the pastors and the leaders better than the person that is actually sitting you. Why? Because they don't have a microphone? Let's think about it and be honest. Because we are ourselves Pharisees. We are ourselves the ones that pick and choose how we treat others and how we relate to other people based on how they look. But we also place so much expectations over people, including ourselves, where that's not what Jesus did. And that's why he was so controversial, because he treated everybody the same. You could be the prostitute, and I love you, and I stand up, and I'm sorry, I kneel down, and I look into your eyes, and I take you up. I treat you the same. The kids, the, the disciples, take the kids away from Jesus. And Jesus was like, oh, no, honey, let the kids come to me. And he put them in his arms. But they, he also saw the scribes and the really, you know, like good people that knew the Bible and actually wrote it. Oh, same thing because for him it, go, it was beyond what they carried and what they had on it was their hearts so i think that we need that's why we need to learn to love like jesus because if not we're just repeating the same story that's great steph yeah so going back to these three things the pharisees and the the religious leaders showed us the first thing is asking the question, how do we stop placing unrealistic expectations on others and ourselves? Because if we're going to have healthy relationships and we are going to love like Jesus, we need to learn how not to place unrealistic expectations on people. I can't live my life with Steph after 15 years of being married, me placing unrealist, unrealistic expectations. I, she cannot be perfect. She cannot be perfect. I mean. <laughs> you see, I got, I, yeah, what? No, she can't be perfect. You know, we told you the car example the other day, but like that example, there's so many. Thank you for checking the car after service. That was hilarious. I did catch people. I mean, pe my poor no, car. No, hold on. I catch people like. Because they're looking. At, so, so preaching number, I mean, teaching number one, you spoke about how I 
crash into the mailbox. Into our own mailbox. So now everybody that sees me is like, can I check your car? I'm like, great. So I went to the, uh, to the mall the other day. They didn't want to take my car in the valet parking. No, I'm kidding. No, it's, it's not. It's like, it has a, a dent. Well, it's a big dent being graceful here. Oh, here. You know, we don't have a perfect relationship. But come on, let's be honest. I know that's funny. But that happens more often than we think. That we find ourselves placing unrealistic expectations like they are meant to be this way and my friend is supposed to be this way but they're not being that way and you're supposed to be this way but we never look at ourselves. And what are we willing to do if we're going to be the greatest? We must understand that we can't place unrealistic expectations just like Jesus didn't. And the best way to figure this out is by showing mercy. Yes. Say with me, mercy. Mercy, 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 mercy. mercy. You remember that? <laughs> no? Okay, I'm too old. It's okay. I don't care. <laughs> Being 40 next year. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> yeah, 40. Let's go. What does the dictionary say about mercy? This is the definition. Yes. Compassion or forbearance, which it means a, refrain, a refraining from the enforcement of something. Mercy means compassion or forbearance shown specially to an offender or to one subject to one's power. As in like, I have the right to judge you because of what you've done. But mercy is saying, I choose not to. Yeah, and to put it into practical ways, how can I be merciful? Because it's hard. Mm -hmm. And I think that when it comes to mercy... It's the constant act of listening. I shared about it last week. Mm -hmm. But when you sit down in conversations, when you truly stop, pause, and ask people, hey, so what's your story? So what's going on? So why the faith? <laughs> so, so why are you acting this way? Is there anything that's bothering you? When you just stop and kind of listen, actually, for relationships, people are so shallow yeah. We are so shallow that even in relationships, we just care about the appearance of the person. There is also another um, experiment, social experiment, that's called um, Love is Blind. And they put these people into, po people into pods and they speak for two weeks, uh, just face to face. I'm not encouraging you to go and do that, obviously. <laughs> like, yeah. But what I'm encouraging you to do is that instead of trying to get to know the girl and DM the girl based on her, on her looks on, through Sarah. Instagram and social media, would you be willing to actually invite someone for coffee and have a mature, adult, intelligent conversation with someone? That maybe she doesn't look or he doesn't look exactly your list of preferable looks, but maybe they have a better and nicer and prettier brain than the girls are just being followed because of what they show and how much they show. You guys, brain is better. Everything else just goes away. <laughs> Everything else you can buy it. <laughs> but brain, honey, you either have it or you don't. A heart, a good heart, you either have it or you don't. And when we stop being Pharisees, then we're going to stop looking so much into what the, she has to offer, he has to no, offer. And what they've done, right? Like what and what they've done. done yeah. But more of, this is what I have. Can I listen to your story? You can fall yeah. in love with a heart. Yeah. You can fall in love with a story. You can respect a story. You can respect a heart and good intelligence. And I think that that's something worth thinking of. Because there are so many people today with broken relationships because the first thing that they looked was the looks. And once you get into depth, there is no depth. Mm. And I think it's something that we have to work on ourselves as well. Yeah, and speaking on, you know, placing unrealistic expectations of people and dealing with this by mercy, Steph just said one of the ways for us to grow in mercy, it's by listening. And I think this is why. When you listen to someone with intentionality, you get to know the person. When you get to know the person, you know what? It's very hard to judge someone you understand. It's very easy to judge. Come on, we all know that. But when you get to know the person, you can understand the person. You want healthy relationships? Listen. Listen. 
sit down and listen. They say one of the top three or top five problems of communication and I'm sorry, of divorce, one of them is communication. Exactly because we don't listen. We're easy to judge. Easy to judge. And I, and I think something that Jesus taught us was to listen. To sit down and spend time with people. Can you imagine how the world will be if we just listen to one another? Imagine the impact that would have in our hearts. You want to grow in mercy? Sit down and listen. The second thing, how do I focus on substance rather than appearance? By living in integrity. Integrity means the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, the state of being whole and undivided. Integrity is not just doing the right things, it's doing the right things for the right reason. Let's be even more simple here. To be a person of integrity is to be the same in public as the same in the post, as the same in the private, as the same while I'm working or while I'm worshiping. The same as I am there, I am here. have people around you that are willing to call you into a higher place and when I say this is people that are around you in your circle that are willing to coach you up to coach you out and say you're not living in integrity guys I've been at church for 20 years I have my fears and shares at church I have the my enemies <laughs> the people that have come up and say do not get into my life but I am not willing to relate to someone that is not willing to be truly honest with themselves because I have been called into higher things. Steph, you're not being honest in this. Steph, you're fearful in here. Steph, there is things that you need to work on. The first person, it's him. And then from there, the people that you surround yourself. Because in this generation, all we want is yes people. We want parents that say yes to us. We want parents, we want kids that always say yes, mommy. Yes, daddy. Uh, we want the girlfriend that's always saying yes, do whatever. And we want the boyfriend that says yes to us in everything. We just want yes people around us. And if we truly want to grow and love like Jesus, we need to surround ourselves with people that are willing to look into our eyes and say, hey, do something can we do something about it can we pray together about it mm -hmm. those are the relationships that are truly going to last those are the relationships that are going to help you grow and i think that when it comes to um to to live in integrity i love this that william clement said he said have the courage to say no mm -hmm. have the courage to face the truth do the right thing because it is right these are the magic keys to living your life with integrity but can i tell you that this world doesn't have courage but the Bible says that we should become encouragers when you encourage someone you're giving them courage when you encourage someone and you tell them you need help in this area or I've yeah. seen this there is things that are changing in you what's going on hey you posted something kind of weird I mean is is there anything you want to talk about or I saw you sad that's not the face that you usually have when we become encouragers we become givers of encourage of courage and the Bible says it you want to be someone that has a circle of people that is always giving you and taking you to higher places <laughs> it's not about how much you can serve and how many microphones you get at a time <laughs> it's about sitting with your circle and when you truly pay attention at the person next to you, you will be able to see the differences. You will be able to see the changes and have honest conversation. We have said it, uncomfortable conversations, but that are always gonna take you to grow. And that's when we embrace integrity. Yeah, I wanna say something because back in the day, integrity might sound like this old school like principle. You know, back in the day, they will shake hands and that would be enough. Today you do that and you're gonna get betrayed like this. <laughs> It's like we yeah. have lost this. Our society has lost integrity. Yeah. It, it really has. But not necessarily because this is an old school or traditional thing in our lives. It means that it's wrong. I love what Jimmy Carter said. He said, We must adjust to changing. Yes, we must adjust to changing times and still hold to unchanging principles like integrity. Yeah. Like integrity. Be the person that you are everywhere even if that costs you some relationships. 
even if it costs you some relationships, it'll win you some, some better. Now, how, how do I grow in integrity? Obviously, with doing what's right for the right reasons. But let us present you something that maybe you've never considered before. Maybe you've done it, maybe you've not. It's what we call secret generosity. Have you ever been at a coffee shop and told the barista that is taking the register? You go like, can I leave you a 20 so that you can pay for the next two people? And you're out of the place. That's no, called secret I, generosity. I haven't seen that. I've seen the ones that said, and can you take a picture of me so I can post it? Yeah. Because that's what society is. Is let me be generous, but let me post about it. Now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. That's fine. You can do that. Like, you can tell the, the person next to you, can I pay for you? For, for you? That's, that's completely fine. Do it. It's, it's a beautiful thing to do. The Bible says we are created to good, do good deeds. Be generous, please. That's awesome. But there's a, there's a deeper level to generosity, and it's when it's secret that your left hand does not find out what your right hand is doing. There's something special. There is a different level of soul searching when it comes to that. There's when, when nobody knows, when, when nobody will find out. There has a special meaning. That generosity showcases the integrity of your heart. It's a, it's a holistic approach to generosity in this case. If you do that, Nobody will know. Obviously, God does. But nobody would know. I would encourage you, if you do it, let it sink in the deepest of your soul and enjoy the satisfaction that God grants you by doing so. It is a, probably one of the most Christ-like things that we can do. Because nobody will ever know. Don't bring it up in the next meeting, right? It's like, did you know that I did this? In that moment, it loses status. It's not bad. It's not bad. It becomes just an encouragement, which is a good thing. It's a good thing. Of course, we are created for good deeds. But when you leave it as a secret, it can penetrate the deepest of your soul and set, and you will feel something that you've never felt before. It's a holistic practice. It's beautiful. I encourage you to do so. You will grow in integrity. Yeah. And it's just not only with, with things that you give, but it's also the time that you give. Not every body that you meet with, not every conversation that you have, not everything that you do has to be shown or has to be shared. Or you only give people, you know, the ones that with the titles and the ones with the microphones, just, those are the only ones that you give time to. Be generous with your time. Be generous with the person that you just saw sitting and maybe smiled at you. That's how you start relationships. That's how you start friendships. You know that you need about 118 hours to from a acquaintance to, to from an acquaintance to become a friend? 118 hours. What does that mean? It means time. It means investing. It means that you're willing to give, um, to pause other things, to be able to get to know someone. We are at the loneliest time in, our, in, in society. Mm -hmm. we, there is more people on earth, yet people feel the loneliest. Most of the people that I talk to say, I don't have friends. It's that I feel alone. I'm around so many people, but I feel alone. There is now social media that is supposed to connect us. You know what it is? We forgot to be friends. We don't know how to friend, be friends. We, we don't know how to relate like Jesus. But to be a friend, we got to show up a friend. Are you willing to give yourself that space to be, to live in, to be generous with your time, to live in integrity? to stop judging and asking people to be, you know, calling them into this higher level that you're not willing to walk also. Friendships, when we speak about in the mind, relationships, they touch your soul in ways that money can't, a car can't, and a big house can't. Because we are meant to relate. We are meant to have this vitamin people in our lives where we can be honest to and we can talk to. 
but it's a matter of making a decision and say I am open to relate to others yeah and the third thing how do I choose service over status well by being humble of course how do I grow in, humil in humility well by serving <laughs> as simple as that I pray that we can be a church that it, that that does not perform may our service never become a performance may we be people of integrity that love like Jesus and serve genuinely and humbly Martin Luther King said this and may this be a question we pose ourselves every day life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others can I ask you that today what are you doing today for others we have one more principle to go we're gonna fly into it principle number eight treat others as you want them to treat you in relationships this is the norm you won't let me lie I'm gonna treat others three ways the ways they they have treated me I'm gonna treat others the way others have treated me or I'm gonna treat others how I think they're going to treat me but because we live by Jesus and we choose to follow his example and love like him there is a different set of rules Luke chapter 6 27 31 you find it 31 says treat others as you want them to treat you have you heard that it is called the golden rule treat others like you want them to treat you but I love Jesus and I love how he comes and elevates principles that feel so many times mundane to us or we are just simply used to love your neighbor like you love yourself I got you with a new commandment love your neighbor like I have loved them the golden rule says treat others as you want to treat them Luke 6 36 says therefore be merciful just as your father is merciful so how about we elevate the golden rule in our relationships I won't simply treat you like I want you to treat me how about if I treat you like God treats you imagine how our relationships will grow if that will be our mentality today yeah and today we finish this series and we just hope that this becomes an invitation as a church all of us as a community to relate better if I commit myself to relate better, to have these conversations, to, to, to be open into listening to people's stories. If I commit, he commits, Henry commits, Julie commits, Karen commits, Adrian commits, if, if Emily commits, if Jeannie commits, if we all commit. Just as a church, we will be different. And we just want to share with you some next steps after this and hopefully we have them on the screen so you can just take a picture really quick but um the first one that we just want to leave you with is make regular on schedule and unhurried time for people or family with people family or friends just regular on schedule and unhurried time go to the beach go to the parks so south florida has beautiful times that you can literally just go and sit down and, and, and go for coffee or have a picnic, but schedule it and say, we're gonna, ha we're gonna schedule an unscheduled time where there is no agenda, where there is no, what can you give me or what can I give you? Let's just talk, let's put a topic, let's, let, let's just hang out. Number two, be authentic and embrace vulnerability. Invite into your heart those who share your awesome news but also those that cry with you when you share your hard stuff don't don't just surround yourself with the yes people and the people that are always yes but when you're crying they're like eh, too much a little too much drama <laughs> embrace the people that are willing to cry with you when pain comes take time to listen to people's stories relate with the person not what they have or what they do throw away the diplomas the bank statements and su success stories from your mind when you're going to relate throw all of that away and just relate with the person be the kind of person that people who hurt you and who are hurt by you instead of giving up 
choose to work through it and finds healing and restoration. And last one, invite intentionally people who live on mission beside you, who challenge you and make you better. Can we take a moment to pray for you and your relationships? Um, we're thankful for your lives. You can, you can stand up. Um, we're thankful that we're together in a community. But we also understand relationships are not easy and people will fail and people will make mistakes. But if we just follow Jesus' ways, we will find the healthiness that our relationship needs to keep on growing. Father, today we are just thankful as we close these four weeks of principles and conversations that have led us to love like you, Jesus. I pray that today you can give us the will and the desire to apply these principles that it's not just knowledge, but it becomes revelation. It becomes truth in our hearts that we may take action upon these principles so that we can love like you did, so we can love like you love us. So I pray, God, for our hearts today. Holy Spirit, you know those who are going through breakup and hurt and pain because of relationships. I pray for every heart that is damaged today. Every heart that was damaged by people that were supposed to serve them. Maybe a pastor, maybe a leader, maybe a family member. They were supposed to spend time. They were supposed to add and not to rest. God, to take away, I pray for the wounds. That you can bring your healing presence where it hurts a lot that there can be process, that there can be mercy, that there can be grace, that we can pursue you, Jesus. Because as we love like you, you bring healing to us. You bring hope and we can start trusting in relationships again. So thank you for my brothers and my sisters.